Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. Uh, this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight we are going to, um, well, we're going to continue looking at uh, the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha, but we're going to move to a different section of the of the the samyutta so just really quickly so that you know this giant collection of sutras is divided into five sections the first section is the section of gathas the collection of verses and we just concluded i guess that was last week we concluded the section on the bhikkhunis, the, the nuns and their, their poems. Well, those were sutras that, that were, they are sutras that revolve around verses or these gathas. So we read at least 10, oh no, we read 10, 11, I think 12 suttas from that first section. Um, then the second section of this is the section on causation, on the nidanas, the basically dependent origination, the 12 link chain of dependent uh, causation. So that's the second section. And when I was up in San Francisco a uh, number of, I guess, months ago now, I did a whole kind of workshop on a sutra from that section. And then when we came back online, I did another sutra from that section. So we've dabbled a little bit in the Nidana section. Today, we're going to dive into section three. So the third division of this is all about, it's the Kanda, Kahanda Samyutta, the collection of sutras that are about the Skandhas, or in Pali, it's the Kat. Kandaha. So we're going to dive into that tonight, and we might kind of spend a few Sundays here talking about the, aggre uh, the aggregates, as they are called. Um, and then really quickly, the fourth division of sutras that we will maybe dive into at some point is about the senses, the ayatana, the six sense bases, so it's all sutras that are centered around the six sense bases. And then the final group of sutras is called the Mahavaga, the great book. And it is a gathering of a bunch of different sutras, kind of on a lot of different topics. But we've read in Dharma Doors, we've read one of the sutras from that section because it is the very, very first sutra the Turning the Dharma Wheel Sutra, the Buddha's very first sermon is located in the big book, the Mahavaga at the end. So those are the five divisions of the Samyutta Nikaya. And again, we're about to dive into part three. Now, as far as part three goes, my, one of my favorite sutras about the Skandhas is the very, very first sutra in this collection it's called the Nakula Pitta, uh, the Nakula Pitta Sutra. Uh, if you happen to have the big uh, wisdom publication edition, this uh, whole section begins on page 853 with the Nakula Pitta Sutta. And I've done a whole Dharma Doors session on Nakula Pitta. And if you go to my uh, SoundCloud page where I post all my audio recordings, I recently did a recitation of this sutra. So I've explored that sutra a lot. And that would sort of be my go-to sutra to talk about skandhas. I had thought about doing the third sutra in this section called um, the Halidakini sutta and i might do that next week i'm not sure but i decided a good place for us to start is going to be again if you have the the wisdom publication over on page 871 there's a kind of little 
um, it's a subsection of the section on the skandhas. And this little subsection is called the burden, bahara. And the very first sutra of this section is the bahara sutta, the sutra or the sutta on the burden. So I wanted to start with this one because it's sort of like there's two or three really important ideas in here. And it's not um, it's not clouded with a lot of other teachings. It's just this really straightforward teaching on the skandhas. And I wanted to start with this, or I wanted to talk about this tonight, because it's kind of a very logical next step from where we were last week. So if you've been coming to Dharma Doors and you've been with us in looking at the Samyutta Nikaya, the last sutra of the nuns, the uh, Vajira, Vajra, the nun whose name is Vajra, she sort of dropped um, you know, some major ideas on us. And even like before last week, like the week before, all of those, the nuns, the sutras about the nuns, they were all coming back to this same idea. And it's this idea of, well, you could say it's the idea of no self, or it's the idea of the five skandhas, but there was a way in which the idea was coming around to that. And so I think this is a good place to start for our kind of, or to continue in that way. Um, yeah, let's just go ahead and get into it because there's a lot to discuss. So as usual, with the suttas in this collection, we don't have elaborate introductions. We don't have, thus have I heard, one time. We are just thrown right into the action at Shravasti. <laughs> so we know that this sutra, like many, many other sutras, takes place at Shravasti. And there, the Bhagavan, the world honored one, the blessed one, said this, Bhikkhus, I will teach you the burden, the carrier of the burden, the taking up of the burden, and the laying down of the burden. Listen to that and attend closely. I will speak. So this sutra is called Bahara. And that's a kind of a, it's an interesting word. It's an interesting idea. And, you know, it, it means what you would think it would mean. It means a, a burden. Like we talk about having a weight on your shoulders or like a burden in that way. That's what they're talking about. This word, though, it's going to be complicated. It's going to be particularly complicated because of these ideas of the carrier of the burden, what it means to take up the burden, and what it means to put down the burden. So... In order to understand the sutra, we need to understand what is the Buddha talking about in terms of this burden. But that's where sutras are always so, you know, enlightening because they dive, they dive right in. And what bhikkhus is the burden? What is bahara? It should be said, the five aggregates subject to clinging. And then what five? Well, of course, the form aggregate subject to clinging, the feeling aggregate subject to clinging, the perception aggregate subject to clinging, the volitional formations aggregate subject to clinging, the consciousness aggregate subject to clinging. This is called the burden. So let's talk about the burden. Let's talk about this. So the first thing is, is that the Buddha defines the burden as the five aggregates. So the five skandhas, once again, we are in the division of the Samyutta Nikaya that's all about the skandhas. 
As usual with Dharma doors, though, I kind of always presume there's somebody out there that has never heard of the aggregates, that has never heard of the skandhas. So I apologize if, you know, we're going to travel some trod ground. But I will, I, I, I always try to work in a little bit of new information when we talk about old ideas like this. So first of all, the skandhas. I can't tell you how important this teaching of the five skandhas is to Buddhism. I know that we talk a lot about the Four Noble Truths as like the essential Buddhist teaching, but as far as I'm concerned, the five skandhas are kind of the essential teaching in a way. And I say that because if you understand the five skandhas, you kind of almost intuitively understand the noble truths in a way. But let's talk about what that is. So the word skandaha. So the the root, the root of this word skandaha is the last part of it, daha. That root word is dar, and it is the root of the word dharma, And it means to hold, to have or to hold is dar. But this is skandahar. And skandahar, I've I've spent a lot of time this evening looking for the exact etymology of skandahar. And I have to tell you, it does appear that it's one of those situations where in Sanskrit, the word skandaha has one meaning and the buddhists use kandaha or skandaha in sanskrit they use it slightly differently so the basic idea of skandaha is a mass a, like a pile uh, and in many ways the english use of the word body but I don't mean like your physical body. I mean, in English, we talk about like a body of water or a body of knowledge. So a body of something is like a group of something. So in regular Sanskrit, the word skandaha sort of is just a reference to the body, in particular, the shoulder but in buddhist usage a skandaha is tr- it's translated as an aggregate and the buddhist use of the word skandaha is about this kind of binding together there's there's almost a sense if if you would like you could think of it as almost a kind of gravity that is like a binding together of things, like even thinking about molecular bonds, that's a kind of aggregation or it's this kind of skandaha. So it's important as we move into this tonight that we have a, a kind of a baseline understanding that a skandaha is this kind of fusing together a binding together a bringing together but i want you to tonight i would like for you to have that kind of sense of gravity in that way where there's a pulling in in that sense now one of the ways one of the ways that i like to teach the five skandahas is this so these skandhas which They, meaning Bhikkhu Bodhi, Bhikkhu Bodhi is the translator, and he uses this language of form, which we will talk about as for the first of the aggregates, form, and then feeling, and then volitional formations, or sorry, perception, volitional formations, consciousness. That's how Bhikkhu Bodhi translates the five skandahas. I usually use the more kind of the, I usually use the language of form, sensation rather than feeling, 
perception, so form, sensation, perception. I prefer conditioning or habits or habit energy. We will talk about this idea of volitional formations as a translation of samskara. And then consciousness. So form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. Normally, when we talk about the skandhas, the five aggregates that I just named, normally we think about the aggregation. We normally think of the aggregation as being the aggregation of form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. Meaning that we normally think, or it is normally taught, that the skandha is about those five things, five dharmas, coming together. But I think it's really important that you know that each of the five skandhas is itself a skandha, meaning an aggregation. So I'll walk you through, the, through this, and we're going to start with the first of those. The aggregate, the skandaha of form. So, you know, I'm, I was reading this, I was preparing for tonight earlier, and I was reading, you know, I was reading this line, you know, so, and what bhikkhus, what bhikkhus is the burden? Oh yeah, please tell us Buddha, what's the burden? Well, the form aggregate subject to clinging. What is like, if you really think about it, what does that mean in English? The form aggregate subject to clinging? It's like kind of, it, you know, so let's, let's get comfortable with this kind of language. So the form aggregate, Rupa Skandha. So, it sounds complicated, the form aggregate, but it's not that really that complicated. The first of the five skandhas is the physical body. That's the body of form. That is the idea of form subject to clinging. But we need to think about this a little bit. How is it that the physical body is an aggregation. Well, we need to understand that in traditional Buddhist thinking, which is sort of based upon traditional Indian thinking, anything that is made of matter, anything that is physical in this world is an aggregation of four elements, they are called the four great elements. So you probably know them as earth, water, fire, and air, but I'm always reminding people that if this is not as archaic as it sounds. I know that when we hear about earth, wire, earth water, fire, and air, it sounds like they were, they must've been cavemen if they thought there were only four elements. No, they weren't cavemen. They weren't archaic in that sense. We just need to understand that the four elements, the element called earth is about density, solidity. It's about things being solid. The water element is about things being in a liquid state. The fire element is about temperature. It's about how everything in this world has a temperature and normally, I, I like to point this one out a lot, the tea inside my cup is a different temperature than the cup. The tea inside the cup is liquid. The cup is solid earth. And so I don't get confused about the cup versus the tea. I don't think that they're the same thing because the cup is the earth element, it is solid. The tea is the liquid element made of quote water element. And the two have a kind of different temperature. The tea is very hot in that way. So that's the third element. The fire element is about heat. 
And then the wind element, the fourth element, wind, is about movement. Many things in this world are moving, like people and creatures. And then if you look at like a rock, it's not moving. <laughs> and that's because a rock doesn't have any wind element. Now, it might have a trace amount of wind element if it is growing crystals, for example, which is movement. But my point is, is that you can view everything in this world as configurations of the four elements. Now, when it comes to the physical body, <clears throat> excuse me, the bones, like my skull and the bone structure, very high on earth element, very dense, very hard, very opaque, no light goes through the bones. In fact, x-rays have a hard time going through the bone. But x-rays have no problem going through the flesh, which is sort of kind of dense. It's got earth element, but it's also got water element to it as well. So my flesh is not as dense as my bone, but then there's the blood, the snot, the saliva, and everything that is the water element. Last time I checked, I come in around 98.6 degrees on the fire element. So I have that as my fire, my heat element, and I'm breathing and I'm moving. So I'm all full of wind element. If you look at my little bird friend over there, my little bird friend hasn't moved for years and years and years. And so it has no wind element in that way. And in fact, it's ultimately just made of paint in that sense. But my point is, is that anything and everything can be understood as an aggregation of the four elements. And that includes the physical body. So the first of the five aggregates is the aggregation of the four elements but in Buddhism or in kind of Indian thinking, an aggregation of the four elements, any, any aggregation of the four elements, they use the term rupa. And rupa means form or shape. But the implication is that it is the particular formation of the amalgamation of the four elements in that way. So that's the first aggregate. It is the physical body. Now, of the five aggregates, we need to understand that the first of them, rupa, which is the four elements, skanda, skandahad together, that first aggregate is the only aggregate that is material, that is physical sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, the next four skandhas are considered immaterial. They are not physical things of this world. They are basically mental phenomena. And this is where early Buddhism, if you didn't know this, early Buddhism does have a mind-body distinction. They make a distinction between that which is physical, which is anything made of the four elements, which is called rupa. And then there's things that are of the mind. So we need to understand <clears throat> we need to understand that. So we're not getting anything more physical. The next are going to be mental in that way. But before we get to those, I want to mention something really kind of important. I don't want this to kind of be a surprise at the end. I kind of, I want us to understand this now. So what we need to understand is that the Buddha's teaching about the five aggregates, basically what happens is, is that in Buddhism, they have this teaching of no self, anatman or anatta. 
And so there's this idea that we have of ourselves. And the Buddha basically said, no, there's no that. There's not actually that self you think of. There's the five aggregates. So I want us to understand that when Buddhism or when the Buddha or whatever, when Buddhism sort of takes the self away in its place, it is suggesting that there are the five aggregates. So what we're talking about in technical speech, we are talking about the sentient subject. We are talking about the sentient agent. So we are talking about you, but we want to be careful with our, you know, you and me. We want to be careful with those ideas tonight. And what I mean, and let me just kind of mention this one example. What Buddhism is, or early Buddhism, and I do want to emphasize that tonight we are talking, or at least at the beginning tonight, we're talking exclusively early Buddhism. Early Buddhism is basically saying that right now, there is a conscious experience arising from everything that's being experienced right now. What you are hearing, what you're smelling, if you've tasted anything, what you're feeling, what you are then thinking, all of that is giving rise at this very moment, is giving rise to a conscious state of experience. But that conscious state of experience can become confused or diluted in a lot of different ways. One of the ways that that conscious, this conscious experience, one of the ways it becomes confused is it starts thinking in terms of me. And that's the self that the Buddha is going to say, you know what, that self doesn't really exist. And what we mean is, is this, and again, apologies for all of you out here that already get this, but for those of you who don't, it has to do with this idea of, and I was thinking about it earlier, it's so simple. It's like so complicated, but so simple. It's all, it can all be summarized with this one idea that we have. When I was little, when I was little, and what we mean, of course, in English is when I was a kid, when I was a child, but I want to focus on specifically this idea of when I was little, L like meaning literally when I was littler than I am now. And what I want you to notice is that when we say that, when we think that, when we think that very idea of when I was little, we have all of a sudden, we've set up this situation where there's me now that has an adult, an adult body, me. But then there's this idea of me when I was little. And so if you think about that, meaning you literally think about your little body, <laughs> that physical body of form, that aggregation of the four elements from, let's just say, when we were 10. So for me, that's about 40 years ago. The idea is, is that that 10-year-old body of form, am amalgamation of the four elements, that is not this. This is this amalgamation of four elements. That was that amalgamation of four elements. But when we think, when I was little, so now what we have is you as a child and you as an adult. And what I mean is, is that there's the big body and there's the little body. And then there's you that currently has a big body, but used to have a little body. And that's starting to sound like you, okay, so you are not the little body or the big body. So what are you? 
And that is the very idea of an Atman. That which is not the little body or the big body, but the soul or the essence, the very idea that there is, and this is, by the way, this is sort of my language or the language I like to use to describe it. We have this notion that when I was little, I was there. And when we say that, what we think of, or I know what I think of, it's this idea that somehow behind the eyes and between the ears, there's the real me that is like the experiencer of my life. And the experiencer of my life was there when I was little and is here now and will be here tomorrow and will be here next week. This is the idea of a self, the experiencer of our life, all of it. The Buddha came along and said, oh yeah, that self, that's a delusion of this current configuration of five skandhas. There is this current configuration of five skandhas having this experience, but this experience thinks it was that experience as well, meaning the experience of being little. And that's where the Buddha said, you don't get to have it. You don't get to have both the little body and a big body. You are this here now experiencing this. And in fact, this very state of mind is arising from everything you are presently in contact with. So you are kind of tapped into your environment and there's an experience being had from that. And that was not present when you were 10 years old. There was that happening then, and there is this happening now. The confusion is that there's a self that was present for both of them and that it's the same self. But again, we would need to ask, what is that? Where is that? Where is that self that was there when we were 10 and is here now, but is not the 10 year old or the adult? Again, Buddhism basically ultimately says there just isn't that self. It's a fabrication of this present moment. Other philosophical traditions, other religious traditions are still in a way searching for the true self that is underneath the childhood experience and this experience. Buddhism basically said, oh, there's not that self in that way. Now, I, the reason why I'm saying all of this is because, yeah, so the question uh, Renata has is, what if others can confirm the experience one had as a kid? This isn't about that. It's about being under the impression that that experience happened to you. Whether people, it doesn't matter whether people confirm it or not. It's thinking that that experience from the past happened to you. Did it happen to you? Well, you need to have that idea of me. And what we're doing here tonight is we're examining that very idea of me. One aspect of, quote, you is the physical body. But what we're talking about is how that physical body is constantly morphing and changing. And so you are a different physical body of form every single moment. Every time a hair falls out, you're a new configuration of the four elements. And this process of change, it goes on continually in that sense. I often use the example of if you unfortunately lost a hand, would you still be you? And the I answer is, well, yeah, I just don't have a hand anymore. I now only have one hand. So the idea is, so do you essentially truly 
have two hands or one hand. And there's this idea that like, well, I have two hands, but I currently only have one hand. But my natural state is that I have two hands. And again, that's where you don't get to have it both ways. You don't get to be both versions of the physical body. So my point is, is that you are this present configuration of the first skandha. You are this physical body. But if you were to lose a finger or lose a hand, you would now be that physical body. So it just keeps kind of morphing in that way. And it has been, again, since childhood in that sense. So the first aggregate is the aggregate of form, which is to say physicality, which is to say an aggregation of the four elements. But those four elements are constantly morphing and changing. So there's no fixed first skandha. It's not fixed. It's changing. Questions about the first skandha. Cool. Now I wanna draw your attention to a very important part of that first, uh, for that first section or that first paragraph. When the Buddha says, or I guess it's the second paragraph, apologies. The Buddha says, and what is the burden? The burden is the five skandhas subject to clinging. The form aggregate subject to clinging. And then the other ones are called that aggregate subject to clinging. So clinging is upadana. Upadana, it's one of the 12 links of the chain of dependent origination. It can be translated as clinging, grasping, appropriation is one of the terms I like to use. Now, what we want to notice in terms of what the Buddha is teaching here. Now, if you remember, or if you already know, the cause of suffering in that way is this clinging or this craving in that way. So what we want to notice is, is that the four elements, the first aggregate of form, all by itself is subject to clinging. This is why I wanted you to kind of think about it in terms of like a gravitational force. And it's this idea that even just the first aggregate, just this body of form is subject to clinging. And you want to know, or you want to see how that works. It's really interesting. Watch. So you see this? just falls right off me. And that's because that mechanical pencil, it's not part of quote me. But notice, notice how this, the hair, it sticks to me. So notice how the physical body sticks to itself. That is the first aggregate of form being subject to clinging. So what I mean is, is that the physical body itself is already programmed to be clingy in that way. And it's doing it all the time. But here's the thing about it. It's a good thing because my guts would be falling out all over the place if my body didn't cling to itself. So we don't really want to vilify this clinging. It's why I wanted to compare it to gravity. Gravity is not evil. It's just what's kind of happening in a way. So we want to notice that the physical body is already, or it already has the tendency to cling in that way. Now, that's again, that's the physical aspect of the experience called you. So the particular body of form that you're in. Now, the second aggregate. The second aggregate is not material. Again, it is not physical. 
It is called Vedana. Vedana, like in the Bhikkhu Bodhi translation, is translated as feeling. I often kind of mention that for me, in English, the way that I use English, the word feeling for me is either tactile or emotional. Just, this is just me speaking, that when I hear the English word feeling, I either assume that you're talking about feeling or feelings, like emotional feelings. But I don't think of seeing. I don't think of hearing. I don't think of smelling. I don't think of tasting. When I hear the word feeling, that's why I think sensation is a slightly better translation for the term Vedana. Because what Vedana is, well, it's actually very complicated. There's a whole sutra on Vedana. I taught a, I, I taught a number of years ago. What we need to understand about Vedana is that it is sort of twofold. There's two things going on with Vedana. The first thing that's going on with Vedana is that Vedana are the sensations that one experiences with their sensory organs. But we need to make something very clear. It's all sensory organs from a Buddhist point of view. So what I mean is, is that there's the eyes that sense light, there's the ears that sense sound, the nose that sense sense, the tongue that senses flavors, and then there's the body, all of the rest of it, which senses tactility in that sense. But the body also senses gravity. The body senses, the body senses a lot of different things. In that way, it doesn't just sense tactiles. But my point is, is that, oh, and by the way, there is also the interesting Buddhist approach to the brain, which is that the brain is a sensory organ. In Buddhism, the brain senses things. This is a major divergence from Western psychology. In Western psychology, the brain is the generator of ideas. In Buddhist, in Buddhist psychology, the brain is more like an eyeball and it senses ideas. It doesn't have ideas. It senses them in that way. Now, if you want to grok, if you want to grok what that means in terms of how is it that the brain senses, let's use this example. So right now, if you're looking at the screen, you can, if you're looking at the screen, you can probably see my record right it's got the black ring it's got the green label it's got the hole in the middle so if right now if you're looking at the screen you you are in contact visual contact with this and so you can see it you are sensing it right now remember my record if right now you can remember the record it's because your brain is sensing the impression that was left by you seeing it. You're not generating the thought of my record. The brain is coming back into a kind of almost tactile contact with it. And so, but if we talk long enough and you forget about my record, it's because your brain is no longer in contact with that sense impression. So thinking is much more passive in Buddhism already because thinking is about just sensing ideas, not having them. 
So you can have sensations of light with the eyes. You can have sensations of sound, sensations of smell, sensations of flavors, sensations of movement or heat or pressure by the body. And you can have sensations of thoughts. So all of those, those are the six kinds of Vedana. But it's not that simple. Vedana is not just the sensation. It's the particular way you respond to sensations. And this is where we get into the language of pleasant sensations, unpleasant sensations, or neutral sensations. So what, a, what Vedana is, is not just the sensation of light, it's whether your reaction to the sensation of light is that you want more of it or you want less of it. Is the light too bright? And so you're closing your eyes because you don't want so much light? Or is it dark and you're opening your eyes really wide and getting your pupils to get really wide because you want more light so that you can see what's going on? Notice those two reactions. If you're in the dark and straining, you open your eyes and you want more light. Or if it's dark, or sorry, or if it's too bright, you close your eyes because you don't want so much light. Noises might be too loud and you don't like them, or they might be too quiet and you want more of them. You're like leaning in, like, give me more, give me more. I can't really hear what you're saying. Same way with smells. You might have a positive reaction to a smell. You might have a negative reaction to a smell. Same thing with tastes. Same things with bodily sensations. And the same thing with ideas. Now, the most important thing to know, or the most important thing to think about regarding the second aggregate of Vedana, it's about how you might react to a sensation differently than I do. So let's take, for example, hearing. In terms of the first aggregate, the body of form, and I want to re reinforce that idea that we're talking about the body of form, the shape. This is important because the shape, the form of your ears dictate how well you can hear. If you had big old elephant ears, you could hear much better than if you had like a cauliflower ear or like an ear deformity that was blocking the ear canal. So I want you to notice right away, there is a direct relationship between the physical body of form and then the sensations that would be arising from that body of form. You can also think about it in terms of the eyes and the actual form of your eyeballs, the actual shape of your eyes determine how well you can see. And now I want you to think about this, which is that you might have, you, you know, you might be nearsighted, you might be farsighted. So you might struggle to see. And so if you're struggling to see, that is because of the shape of your eyes. But what we want to notice is, is that if you had, quote, bad eyesight, your Vedana, your reaction to seeing might be slightly negative because it's fuzzy. You can't really see that well. You'd like to see better, but you're struggling. So it's kind of hard. But wait, you can go get LASIK surgery and they literally change the shape of your eyeballs. They change the physical shape of your body and now you can see better. Notice that your reaction to seeing is now going to be different because you're gonna be like, whoa, I can see all the little leaves. 
I can see all the leaves on the trees. It's amazing. Seeing is wonderful. So notice how before Lasix, seeing was the your reaction to seeing was that it was hard. After corrective surgery, your reaction to seeing is now a pleasant reaction. So what we're drawing our attention to is the relationship between the physical body of form and then the kinds of sensations that arise from it. But remember, it's all about the way you respond to things. Let's take flavor, for example. You might not like pickles. Maybe I like pickles. Same pickle. I take a bite. Positive vedana. Positive sensory reaction. You take a bite. Negative sensory reaction. So what that means is, is that what you are is that you are that physical body, but you are also that way of reacting. And that is not this way of reacting. But what we want to notice is that right now, you may not like pickles, but you could learn or you could, I used to hate pickles. I love them now. So am I like a different person? You could think of it that way. Or I, it, it, it is now this body of form that reacts positively to pickles. It used to be that body of form that reacted negatively to pickles. So the five skandhas explain how it is that you are you and you're not me in that way. But we always want to keep in mind with the skandhas, they are always kind of shifting and changing. And therefore, you're not the quote, same person ever twice. Now, in terms of this second aggregate of Vedana being subject to clinging, what they're talking about is that when you have a positive reaction to something, you want more of it. The normal way these things work is that if you, if you taste something that's yummy, you want another one. And that is the Vedana, the Vedana Skandha, the, the aggregate of sensory reactions subject to clinging. Notice that your sensory reactions are subject to clinging in that way. All right, everybody doing okay with the first two aggregates? Sweet. Next up is perception. Bhikkhu Bodhi translates it as perception, I translate it as perception. The word is samnya, S-A-M-J-N-Y-A. Samnya does mean or can be translated as perception, but here's what we want to do, or here's what we want to notice in terms of perception. Perception in Buddhism is something like this. So I'm going to use this example tonight. So I want you to notice or think about how in a particular state of mind, you can be perceiving two faces. But in another state of mind, you can be perceiving this kind of uh, champagne glass or this goblet in the middle. And what we want to notice is, is that this, as two different people, they can be perceiving two different things, even though they're looking at the same, quote unquote, the same thing. So perception is about what, what you think you're seeing in that way. But don't start thinking that just because you see something that it's the same thing for everybody. So that's where we use an example like this. And what we wanna notice is, is that in terms of perception, perception is super subject to clinging. 
because we want to notice the mind or perception that is sort of clinging at the two faces or maybe it's clinging at the glass in the middle but we want to notice that perception is clingy and one of the things that i want you to know what samya is so this third aggregate of perception what what the word samya actually means is it's kind of about taking different parts and then bringing them together into one coherent object or one coherent whole in that way so once again if you're perceiving the bird over here it's this idea that you you see what looks like a wing you see what looks like another wing you see what looks like the body you see what looks like the beak and the mind or perception is about oh a little beak a little wing a little wing it's a bird i'm perceiving or i'm seeing a bird so samya is this kind of associative thinking where we bring things together into coherent wholes really quickly i want you to know that the fifth aggregate vinyana Vijnana is discriminative awareness. Vijnana is actually the aspect of mind that distinguishes the bird from the flower. So what we want to notice in terms of Buddhist psychology is that there's one aspect of mind that is grouping things together into coherent objects. And then there's another aspect of mind that is discriminating uh, one object from another object. But notice that you can't discriminate this object from that object unless you've perceived this object and perceived that object. So my point is, is that Samya and Vijnana are working together to construct subject, object, and objects in that way. So a big aspect of vijnana, and I know I've skipped to the fifth aggregate. It just kind of fits with samya. In terms of the two aggregates of samya and vijnana, they are what are constructing the idea of self. This, my hand. If I could see, yeah, I could see several of your hands. Those are your hands. So one aspect of Samya is grouping together what is me. And then another aspect of Samya is then differentiating it from you, or one aspect of Vijnana, differentiating it from you. So perception is clingy because it binds these things together in that way. Everybody doing okay with form? sensation and perception now remember you might be locked in to seeing the faces the two faces and so that's your perception and that perception is based upon your sensory experience so the your vedana but the vedana is based upon the body of form meaning in this case your eyeballs if you didn't have eyeballs, we wouldn't be talking about the faces. We wouldn't be talking about all of that. So you need to have the eyeballs with sensory experiences to then perceive the two faces. But if all of a sudden you were like, oh, it's not two faces, it's a glass. Your perception has shifted. In other words, just as the five, just sorry, just as the four elements of the body morph and change, and just as sensory reactions morph and change, your perception can morph and change. And you might have once upon time, you might have been the kind of person that sees two faces, but now you're the kind of person that sees the glass in the middle. So form, sensation, perception. We've already dealt a little bit with the last one, vijnana. 
Now we just have to deal with the fourth one, samskara, conditioning. What are you? What is that over there listening to this? Well, it's that body of form having those sensations and reacting to them the way that you're reacting to them. And therefore it's perceiving what you're perceiving, but you're doing all of that, meaning you are reacting the way you're reacting and therefore you're perceiving what you're perceiving because of past conditioning. The idea is, is if I showed this to you and you saw two faces and then I showed it to you again and you saw two faces, the perception has been reinforced. Meaning you thinking about it that way twice has reinforced that. And that speaks to your conditioning. You are conditioned entirely differently than I'm conditioned. Your physical body is entirely different than my physical body. The way that you react to sensation is different than mine. What you're perceiving is different than what I'm perceiving. And so from all of that, meaning from the body of form and the way that we react to sensations and the way we perceive, which is being dictated by our past conditioning, there is this present state of discriminative awareness, this present state of consciousness arising that is listening to this right now. But again, all of these five aggregates are constantly changing. And so insofar as the sentient subject is the amalgamation of the five skandhas, the sentient subject is never the same sentient subject twice in that way. Okay, we've gone through all five aggregates and those all together is the burden. Any questions before we proceed? All right, so those are, oh, and by the way, and then consciousness is clingy because of course we cling to what we are conscious of at any given moment in that way and start to get clingy to ideas. So I want to remind you that all five aggregates are clingy. They're all already in a mode of clinging in that way. And what bhikkhus? is the carrier of the burden, it should be said, the Pugala or the Pudgala, the person, meaning this venerable one, such and such, of such and such a name, of such and such a clan, this is called the carrier of the burden, the Bahirahara or the Baharahara is what it is. So I want to tell you, and it's a little late for all of this, but it's okay. This sutra, the reason why I chose this particular sutra, this sutra is very famous for this part that I just read. Who is, what is the carrier of the burden? And the Buddha says it's the pudgala, the person. And then uses this kind of stock phrase, which is venerable so-and-so and -so of such and such a clan. So that is the carrier of the burden. And what I want you to know is that in early Buddhism, there was a lot of debate about the Pudgala, or in, in Pali, it's called the Pugala. So this Pudgala, this person, in, early, in the early form of Buddhism, a lot of the early schools of Buddhism, they started splintering off. And many of them splintered off from the other groups because of this sutra. And it was because the Buddha introduced this idea of the Pudgala. 
the carrier of the burden. And what there was one particular school of early Buddhism, and they become known as the Pudgalavadins. They were the group of Buddhists that latched on to this idea of the Pudgala. And basically what they said was, right here, the Buddha says it. There's the five aggregates that are subject to clinging, and there's the carrier. And, oh, and that's the burden, the five aggregates. And there's the carrier of the burden. So there must be something that isn't the five aggregates, but that carries the five aggregates. So the Pudgalavadins, they latched on to this sutra and they said, no, no, the Buddha talks about a Pudgala. And so this school broke off. They didn't last very long, by the way. They broke off sorry, and they basically insisted that there was this idea of the pudgala, the person that is distinct from the five aggregates. Now, I need to tell you this. All of the mainstream schools of Buddhism, meaning the mainstream early schools of Buddhism, they all thought the pudgala vadins got it wrong. Everybody thought that the Pudgalavadins got it wrong. And eventually the Pudgalavadins, they die out. So my feeling is, is that they got it wrong in that way. Again, most of the early Buddhists think so. But what I want you to know is, is that in the Mahayana tradition, and the Mahayana tradition sort of being best represented by the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, the Diamond Sutra is all about how there is no Pudgala. It is adamant about this idea that there's no Atman, there's no Pudgala, there's no Jiva, there's no Sattva. So there's no self, there's no being, there's no personhood, and there's no life. So the Diamond Sutra or the Vajra Sutra seems to kind of be a reaction to these early schools of Buddhism that were saying, maybe there's a Pudgala. No. <laughs> so Mahayana says no Pudgala and mainstream Hinayana says no Pudgala. But I want you to know that they get that idea from this sutra. And it's one of the only places, by the way, that the Buddha even intimates such an idea. So... Questions about the Pudgala? Yeah, Maria. Excuse me. Um, how do they get to there's no life from? Yep, that's a that's an easy one. Um, or I mean, it's not easy, but first of all. I'm going to answer Maria's question about how the Mahayana gets to no life, but I want to make it clear that we're talking about Mahayana Buddhism real quick. So we're, we're taking an aside. Maria, anybody else out there, if you understand, in terms of my cups, <laughs> my big cup and my little cup, if you remember, we are talking about characteristics of things or lakshana, and the size of something, of course, is a lakshana, big or little. Now, if you remember that teaching, Maria's nodding her head like, yep, I, I remember the big cup, little cup. Then it's the idea that I have the characteristic of being alive. And you think that because the bird has the characteristic of not being alive. But remember, the most important part of my big cup, little cup, we think that the characteristics of things are inherent. Meaning we think that this is actually a little cup when actually it's not. It's not big or little, but depending upon which kind of cup it's next to, it could be perceived as big or little. 
So if you remember that Lakshana characteristics are not inherent, then the characteristic of being alive is not inherent. It is a dependently originated characteristic based upon what you think is not alive. Big cup, little cup, alive and dead. It's the same idea. Now, what that means, of course, in a very mystical, profound way, is that the bodhisattva, in that sense, is neither living nor dead. Just as I am not big or little, I am neither living nor dead. This is, by the way, again, bracketed. This is a Mahayana idea. The early Hinayana does not go this far with the teaching of emptiness in that way. So just want to make that clear. Make sense, Maria? Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I, I know this, but for some reason, I just need to hear it over and over and over again. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, the other analogy didn't work for me. I'm the same size I was when I was 10. <laughs> Fair but enough. It can't all work for everyone, right? Fair enough. Maybe, maybe a wrinkle or two more in terms of the morphing and changing, but. Okay, so that's just a quick thing about the Pudgala, Pudgala. So, but if we understand that there isn't an inherent soul, self, or Pudgala, then what we can understand is, is that the carrier of the burden, like, for example, regarding the five skandhas that are over here, the carrier of the burden is Michael. It's just a question of, well, but what is that? So, and what bhikkhus is the taking up of the burden? It is this tanha. It is this craving that leads to renewed existence, accompanied by delight and lust, Seeking delight here and there, that is, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for bahava, for existence, craving for vibhava, non-existence. This is called the taking up of the burden. So, what is it to take up the burden to pick up to take up the burden is tanha now tanha is this buddhist word for craving but i think it is so important in fact it's so important in this sutra it's so important to understand that the sanskrit pali word tanha it means thirsty it's the Buddhist way of talking about craving and desire. And it's being thirsty in that way. But we need to know that they're talking kind of, that there's a metaphor. And the metaphor is about being thirsty. But when they're talking about tanha, craving, it's complex. Because there's craving that leads to renewed existence. They are talking about reincarnation, and this is the Buddhist idea of reincarnation. We do not get trapped in samsara. We do not keep coming back into samsara because of past karma. In Buddhism, we keep coming back into samsara because we love it. We, we want to come back. It is not about past karmic deeds that need to be you know played out or anything like that in buddhism it is a present wanting and craving that brings us right back into cyclical existence so it is the craving that leads to renewed existence it is this craving that is accompanied by delight and lust seeking delight here and there that is Craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, and craving for extermination, it says. So 
most of you have heard sort of my my basic dharma talk about all of this but because of time i'll put it really simply the basic idea of buddhism is that we creatures and this is my language this is just the way that i put it we outsource our joy and what i mean by that is is that we become conditioned to need things in order to be happy. Meaning our joy, our happiness is dependent upon, and now you fill in the blank because once again, we're all different in that way. What you crave is not what I crave. But the point is, is that it is from a Buddhist point of view, very problematic if you can only be happy, if you have whatever it is, it could be sex, it could be drugs, it could be this, it could be that. But the point is, from a Buddhist point of view, that is a, it's a trap. It's Mara's trap. And it's a trap because if you, if your joy is dependent upon this, that only works as long as you have this. But the moment you don't, you can't find your, the moment you can't have access to your, the moment you're cut off from your, whatever it is, now it's suffering. And that's the noble truth about suffering is that we think that when we get these goodies and we're all happy, we think, ooh, like that's joy. Nope. It's actually suffering. It, it's a, it's a, I call it a semblance of joy. It resembles joy. So that's what the craving that the Buddha is talking about here, craving for sensual pleasures. They might be for the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, all the senses at once. But the point is, is that if you're dependent upon something else for that joy, it, again, it's, it, it's not actual joy. So that's the kind of the basic message about that. So it is craving for sensual pleasures and then craving for existence, which is basically our, you know, absolute fear of dying is craving for existence. It's that actual idea that like, I can only be happy if I'm alive. So it's still dependent upon something. This stuff gets real subtle, by the way. And then there's a lot of um, a lot of commentary or a lot of um, yeah commentary on what the Buddha means by craving for extermination. Usually that's taken as kind of um, craving for existence and craving for non-existence. They're usually understood in these kind of um, Freudian ideas of like Eros and Thanatos the 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 death drive and the the life drive so a lot of times people uh, uh, interpret or they comment on the on the craving for extermination as like the death drive thanatos it could also sort of be i think of it not so much about wishing or hoping that i die although people are of course you know people with suicidal tendencies are plagued by a desire for extermination. And that is a craving. It is a desire that's just as bad as craving for life in that way. But you could also understand craving extermination as being basically a classic example, especially if you're meditating, is an annoying fly. And wishing that the fly would just die that it would, it would go out of existence and leave me alone. <laughs> that could be an example of craving extermination in that way. So questions about what it means to take up the burden. And what bhikkhus is the laying down of the burden? 
it is the remainderless fading away and the very cessation of that same tanha. It's the cessation of that same craving, the giving up, the relinquishing of it, freedom from it, non-reliance upon it. This is called the laying down of the burden. Now, if you if you have the wisdom edition and you read the footnote, or you might have already known, the remainderless fading away and cessation of that same craving, that is verbatim a description of nirvana. Nirvana is described as the remainderless fading away and cessation of tanha. That is what nirvana is. It is the giving up, the relinquishing of it, freedom from it, non-reliance upon it. So this is called the laying down of the burden. So I'm, I'm often mentioning this, by the way. I'm often, um, I often in my Dharma talks, I make a distinction between nirvana and enlightenment or bodhi, awakening. It's important to understand that throughout the sutras, throughout the suttas, the Buddha always defines nirvana as the, as the remainderless fading away of tanha. The craving, gone. Bodhi, awakening, that's like a whole other project that's about pranya, wisdom, understanding dependent origination. Whereas the, the cessation of tanha is an in, 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 in emotional thing. Bodhi is kind of an insight thing. It's an aspect of insight, an aspect of vipassana in that way. Now, really quickly, I do want you to notice, or I want you to, to note, regarding what I just was saying, that we outsource our joy and we put it dependent upon things. We are reliant upon things. We are not free because we are in bondage to those sensual pleasures in that way. So the project of Buddhism is the remainderless fading away and cessation of the craving, the craving for externals in that sense. And the basic idea, as I kind of practice it, as I teach it, it's that there is a much greater joy that comes from freedom, that comes from being independent and not reliant upon things. So that is, for me, what Buddhism is about. That freedom, that independence from being in bondage to things in that way. And on that note, while we still have time, thanks, Noe. So the Buddha describes the laying down of the burden as the remainderless fading away of that craving. And this is what the Bhagavan, the Blessed One or the World Honored One said. Having said this, the Fortunate One, the Sugata, the Well-Gone One, further said this. This is the Buddha's poem. The five aggregates are truly burdens. The burden carrier is the pudgala, the person. Taking up the burden is suffering in the world. Laying down the burden is blissful. Having laid the heavy burden down without taking up another burden, Having drawn out craving with its root, one is freed from hunger, fully quenched. So I do want you to notice just a couple of things about the poem really quickly. So the five aggregates are truly burdens. Um, bahara, bahara have panchakanda. Right. This is the Pali version. So the burden is the five skandhas. The burden carrier, Chapugalo, is the Pudgala. 
taking up the burden is dukkha. So taking up the burden is dukkha. Laying the burden down is sukkha. So you should be familiar with the dichotomy sukha dukkha. Sukkha is bliss. Dukkha is the exact opposite of it. So notice that in Buddhism, there is sukkha. So when the Buddha, or actually, it's not that when the Buddha says, it's when we interpret, if we interpret the Four Noble Truths, if we interpret the First Noble Truth as everything is suffering, we miss the, the point that no, no, there is sukkha. There is bliss. It's just not going to come from anything. It will never come from anything. That's the Buddha's teaching about dukkha. It, this is all dukkha. But if you were free from that, that's true sukkha. So we want to notice the kind of use of sukkha and dukkha in the first stanza. And then having laid down the heavy, leaving, having laid the heavy burden down without taking up another burden, having drawn out craving with its root, one is free from hunger, fully quenched. The reason why the Buddha says they you are fully quenched is because tanha means thirsty. So you kind of miss a lot of the metaphor or like the play of language that's going on with Buddhism if you don't know that tanha means thirsty. They start talking about dharma clouds, raining the dharma, and all of these metaphors of the clouds raining the dharma teachings. If you don't know that they're quenching the tanha, it, it all just sounds, you know, you miss sort of the poetry of it all. So there's that. And just one last thing about um, having laid the heavy burden down without taking up another burden. So you can interpret that a couple of different ways. I think that is meant to mean no more rebirth. After putting the burden down, there's no more taking up of a new rebirth. But I would also want to share with you really quickly, I know we're running low on time. In Dharmador's past, in talking about the idea of the self, and in particular, talking about the construction of the idea of a self, I've often used the example of how we identify or cling. We cling to things like our occupation, we cling to marital status, we cling to our name, we cling to our nationality, we cling to our family, we cling to all of these things. And then we construct this identity that I am the California teacher married guy. Like, so I have all of these aspects of that construction of self. Now, when I talk about this, I mention I could get a divorce and I'm no longer married. But then I would identify as being single. I could identify as my job, but then I could get a new job and identify as that. What I'm often talking about when I do this Dharma talk, I talk about, but what if you actually put it all down? Meaning I'm neither married nor single. I'm not going to play that game. I'm not identifying with my current job or my next job. None of them. I would describe that as putting the burden down and not taking up another burden. And then just continuing this kind of non-clingingness in that way. And you can kind of keep doing that all the way to the insight of no self. All right, everybody, that's going to conclude tonight's Dharmador. Sorry, it was a little long. Any last minute thoughts, questions, or ideas?